can you kind of give me a loose idea of the different types of monsters we're going to see in this? Yes, yes, uh, totally. So it does run that gamut from monsters that are classic D&D style monsters all the way up to uh, very weird uh, eldritch even types of monsters. For example, we have got uh, the Ashen White, which is a new type of undead that is locked uh, in the perpetual motion of the mining that they had to do in life um, as they were killed catastrophically in an invasion thousands of years ago and are now still stuck in various dungeons that are underground that the characters have to investigate. We have got new types of construct monsters that were created by, by those miners to specifically bore holes in the tunnels uh, that, of course, you know, without their masters around uh, are a little bit dangerous when the characters stumble upon them. And then some of those more uh, strange monsters as the plot then starts to thicken and become uh, much more eldritch and much more mysterious. Yeah, so actually, can you kind of give me a little bit of a deep dive into what the Oculorb is? Yeah, so the Oculorb is uh, native to a specific part of the adventure, a specific location in the adventure, in which it will become obvious why the energies have bound these eyes together and animated them and why they have become malevolent. Um, but the, the eyeball, it, it is, it's all about uh, unsettling the characters and petrifying and scaring creatures so that the eye can then eat them. <laughs> There's a monster I need to ask about. It's called the Flesh Meld. Yes. <laughs> it already sounds disgusting. Yeah, it's absolutely disgusting. And it is a whole bunch of flesh all fused together uh, with a giant mouth. If you've ever seen films where there are um, where there are fleshy golems or whether there's um, like zygote type creatures with a couple of different examples I can think of. This is sort of the D&D version of that and it is intended to just be a complete nightmare fuel. <laughs> there's a variety of this particular monster that is disgusting. It's an encephalon chin mute and then there's also a cluster? What What are these things? Yeah, yeah. So uh, so the Encephalon uh, cluster is the brain-shaped monster. It's a large-sized brain-shaped monster that has uh, those little pockets. And um, it, it, it is a dangerous monster in itself. It can attack creatures. It has special abilities of the psychic variety. And then growing inside each pocket uh, in the Encephalon cluster is a little gemule. And these are the offspring of that creature. There are these little triangle-shaped uh, just little bitey monsters that spew out of the brain. And if it's not stopped, then they cause problems, but then they gestate into the big brain monsters themselves. So they can cause a lot of problems uh, if there is one that is spawning a bunch of stuff in a dungeon. We also have like interesting takes. And, and you mentioned the goblins. We've got different types of goblins yeah. here. Goblins that have some, you know, psychic abilities as well. Uh, there's a cloaker mutate. So we're also seeing classic D&D monsters that have been altered. That is true, absolutely. Yes, that is part of the transition, right? So why this adventure feels like a natural progression is because it starts out with that classic D&D element, but then gets into the weird elements which are infusing the plot from the very beginning, as it turns out. And it will become obvious when the characters play through it. Um, but some of those classic monsters become new and fresh when the weird energies start to do strange things to them. One of them is the Cloaker, very classic D&D monster. It's got his flappy wings, he's got his screechy face, but also has little veins of, uh, of green nasty fluid running throughout his body. Uh, and uh, in one memorable incident in the adventure is puppeting the skeleton of a dwarf with his mouth. <laughs> That's so disgusting, I love it. This, yes. is, this is already, uh, this is gonna be a very, very interesting adventure. We might be seeing a different version of another classic monster as well in this book. We will. And in fact, that monster is a, a mind flayer. And this is a mind flayer uh, who is especially a big bruising type of mind flayer that has a, a big tentacle that can lash out and cast spells and smack around upstart player characters and do all kinds of fun things. And mind flayers just might become very important to the plot later on. Uh, if you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> For this adventure, what is your advice for running monsters? Uh, make a lot of weird noises. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Make a lot of screeching and screaming, but uh, but also just learn about the history of the monster. You know, is this a monster that has been around for centuries um, and 
you know, it has a specific experience that they are continuously enacting? Is it a monster that, uh, you know, is, is angry and enraged because of what has happened to the environment around it? Is it a monster that is just alien? There's a lot of monsters uh, and a specific location that is very alien. And uh, the, the mental faculties of the evil creatures, monsters that live there are not human. And they are malevolent, and they are angry, and they are violent, and they're scary. And getting into that, uh, I think, will be very fun for the Dungeon Masters, but will also make running it uh, much easier. What do you love about monsters? Because this is a very, uh, if you love monsters in D&D, this is a very good adventure for you. Absolutely. I love monsters that just go hard at the player characters. I've got nothing to lose uh, that are all about being... Uh, you know, trying to eat the player characters for food or just attacking them relentlessly. Uh, I think that's very fun. I, I also think it's very fun for the player characters to figure out where some of these monsters have come from or figure out whether it's actually a monster at all, whether there's actually a creature that's a monster at all or is it something that they would want to try to talk with and bargain with. And there are plenty of opportunities in this book for that as well. There's a couple other magical items in this as well. There's a thing, there's something called the Luminous War Pick. That is true, yes, um, and that goes to the, and is found in the dungeon, one of the dungeons that is in the Underdark, and this is specifically an old dwarven mining set of tunnels, but also an, a mining outpost. It's one of the places where the characters have to go to find one of the pieces of the Shattered Obelisk. And in fact, there are several dungeons in the book. One of the chapters is three big dungeons in a classic dungeon crawl that is about racing to try to find these pieces of the Shattered Obelisk. Um, but one of them is, of course, in the mining tunnels and in the mining outposts. And one of the magic items you find uh, as part of uncovering the story of what happened in this mining tunnel and what might be currently happening is finding the, the Luminous War Pick, which the uh, Zerf Neblin down there used uh, to help them ward off evil creatures that would crop up and cause problems for their mining operations. There is another magical item in this that's it's called the Mine Crystals. What are those? <laughs> so the Mine Crystals were, uh, in very short, they were um, basically consumable metamagic items. Um, it is a, a way to alter spells um, by using the power that's inherent in these crystals um, that then, you know, don't become useful anymore except for just being crystals uh, and giving characters, you know, a few more options so that not only the sorcerer gets to have fun with that. 